slant picking in, in bluegrass really started with Don Reno, as far as I know. Uh, he was the first guy to really get going on that kind of thing. Doc Watson came along later, at least in terms of our awareness of his music. Don Reno was flat picking early on, as was George Shuffle. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is. Uh, this is a, a tune on a 37 D18. Yeah. Good, good guitar to play up there. What period man? Oh, this is a 25 Gibson F5. Now, when uh, when Gibson gave Lloyd Lohr his walking papers in 1925, uh, they made some immediate changes, and uh, one of the one of the most uh, significant changes was in the finish. They no longer did the oil varnish that uh, they had done for so long. Uh, Henry Ford had invented a process using nitrocellulose to finish automobiles, and that's one of the reasons that automobiles became affordable. And in 1925, it revolutionized a lot of the paint industry and musical instruments as well. The nitrocellulose could go on and be finished and ready to ship in three days whereas the oil varnish that Lloyd Lord insisted on may have taken months. Exactly. So uh, that's the main difference. Other difference is no more silver plating. This is original gold plating. Uh, before Lord, Gibson only did nickel plating on mandolins and guitars, and they saved their gold plating for banjos. Exactly. But they never did any silver plating that I'm aware of Other than until Lord. Lloyd Lord, and the minute he was out of there, they stopped the silver plating. And they also, it's my theory that they were using up these inlays, which was ac actually standard specifications on the H5 Mandola. And there were a batch of this inlay on the Lord Sign instruments on March 31st, 1924. Uh, but for the most part, all the Lords had a flower pot inlay like these others. And this one's a fern. And that's why we call this the fern. And uh, some key players played these ferns. And this one is pretty close to the Bobby Osborne mandolin. That, uh, that became so famous for its unique sound. This banjo has a lower connection as well. <laughs> uh, Lloyd Lore also came out with the master model mandolin, but he also came out, that's where the term master tone came from. It was a Lloyd Lore, uh, the style five banjos came out at the same time with Lloyd Lore mandolins and L5 guitars. And he invented, a, at the time he thought was ingenious, a tone ring. Tone ring is basically what gives banjos volume and sustain. And he came up with what's known as the ball bearing tone ring most part I think he had a big hand in that mm -hmm. and uh, it was made to take care of the fluctuation of cast in heads back then that's all there were there were no plastic heads like we use today Myler uh, <coughs> fluctuated terribly with humidity and he thought that if I could create something that would allow them to rise and expand and contract with the humidity it would take care of a lot of that but it turned out that it took too much away from the wood rim structure itself you had to drill holes all the way around it so it came out there kind of they have a real pretty tone but not a lot of power so uh, that was 25 to 26 in the ball bearing model banjo. This banjo was originally a ball bearing model. And as Tony said about the mandolin inlay, Gibson was well known not to waste anything. If they had something that they could use later on, they would. And this banjo was a holdover, basically. It was a ball bearing that was now the out of date model in 1927, sitting there in the factory collecting dust. Whoever was in charge said, upgrade that to the new cast tone ring model. And that's what happened. They capped the wood rim, put a new label in it, put this neck, this tone ring in it. And it's one of the first cast tone ring models that Gibson made. It's a no hole arch top, very much like the banjo Ralph Stanley played on the Mercury recordings. They have kind of a much keener, brighter sound than the flathead did later on. But they're fun to play. This one's a completely original down to the Manlin fret wire in the <laughs> fingerboard. That's what they were using at the time. So it's an RB4 that came out of the factory with an RB3 neck. Quite an unusual animal. Now, did, did, did any of those banjos with the, uh, the ball bearing tone rings, they still, I don't think I've ever seen yeah, them. Yeah, they make, they make quite a few of them because the banjo was still popular, somewhat popular in the, the mid-20s. As Tony was saying, times changed and interest changed and the guitar was gradually taking over the plectrum and tenor banjo world. The five-string banjo was really, as uh, Tony said about the F5 mandolin, it was a complete and total flop when they, when they came out. There was really no music designed for the five-string banjo other than classical music. Yeah. The old-time rural guys that were playing five-string banjo couldn't afford a mandolin. So a banjo like this sold brand new for $115 a style three years. So that was a lot of money when your average rural 
Uh, Clawhammer player would play in a Sears and Roebuck banjo that you could order for seven dollars for most part out of the catalog. So they couldn't afford them. Most of them bought them secondhand in pawn shops or from the original owners that wanted to sell them later on. You know what? If you drew a line on the map, Danville, Virginia, to Greenville, South Carolina, that was it. I bet you that ninety percent of the five string banjos that were sold. I've said that in the past in writings, and he's exactly right. I feel like a big part of that was due to the, the pioneers of the three finger style. I mean, I can name them, we ain't got enough time to go through it, but a lot of them were right here in the Piedmont area of Carolinas and Western Carolina. And they were playing on radio stations, they were playing local schoolhouse shows, and even the amateur guys that would come to see them wanted a banjo just like these guys were playing. So a lot of those banjos migrated to this area. I've been fortunate enough to find up, dig up a few of them still around here. So uh, that I think you're right, that's where yeah. a big bunch of them ended up. It's the, it's the five string bell. That's right. Right in the middle. The fault line, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay. 